I want to thank the Global Public Policy Institute for the honor of having me here in front of what is a great audience. It's always the greatest to be talking to leaders and future leaders, and I am sure that that's what I have in front of me. Goodness, you all look so good. Um, and also to the Global Public Policy Institute for raising this difficult topic, this challenging topic in this remarkable competition that uh, you all have been so engaged in, and I congratulate all of you for your engagement. We're here in a beautiful sunny day, summer day in Budapest, and look, you're all so engaged with the topic that you're not roaming around enjoying the sun, and I, I appreciate your, your interest and your engagement. When I was a child growing up in New York, one of my favorite spots that I used to like to hide away in, in the city was a tiny little public space that's called Ralph Bunch Park, right outside the entrance to the United Nations building on First Avenue. Uh, Ralph Bunch was the first African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. He was a remarkable civil rights leader and a, and a leader in peacekeeping activities in the UN himself, the then new UN. And in the park is this wall that um, people call the Isaiah Wall for the obvious reason that it has etched into it this very famous quote from the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Uh, that's become such a famous Topic, famous quote that, uh, you know, the, the expression swords, swords into plowshares is a very common expression the, uh, for making peace. This is the prophet's vision of peace. I have to say, though, that when I first uh, looked at that as a, as a kid, I thought, that's a very odd, 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 uh, elo well, I didn't say locution when I was a kid, but a very odd choice of words to learn war. Why didn't they just say they won't make war or they won't wage war anymore? I'm sure that Old Testament scholars could tell us why that is, but um, as we gathered often at this spot for protesting the Vietnam War, that will tell you how ancient I am, um, <laughs> it, it occurred to a lot of us that this was, this was an unusual usual phrasing. Um, I guess it's true that somebody has to learn war, that you don't just make it. Um, Confucius said that if you send uninstructed people into war, it's not a good thing. And I was fascinated to learn as I grew up that in addition, in the United States, in addition to our main military academies, the Army Ac Academy at West Point, the Naval Academy at Annapolis, and so on, our tax dollars were also used for a series of institutions that were called war colleges, the Army War College, the Navy War College, and these were the places where people perfected their knowledge of war. Plainly in the US, uh, learning war is a very serious business. We're here to talk about a particular kind of war, the drug war, and I would like to make the case that while most people think of this phrase, war on drugs or drug war, as purely metaphorical, I think that drug war is more than just a metaphor. I think it's actually quite an accurate term for what's happening now as countries determine national policy to face control of illicit drugs, psychotropic drugs. Um, and I think that that's because clearly this is a militarized war in many parts of the world. Again, thanks largely to uni the United States, but now also to Russia and a number of other places. There are undercover operations as in a war. Um, there are, there's massive taking of prisoners, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And there's really the hallmark of the war, which is that all kinds of violations of people's rights and of their privacy and of their way of doing things are justified by governments on the grounds of preserving pu public order or a national or a higher goal of national security. So I would like to engage your imagination in the idea that perhaps there could be a war college for the war on drugs. And I'd like for us to think about what would the curriculum look like in that drug war college. Um, I'm going to engage in a slight bit of caricature here, but frighteningly actually very little. And we can talk about that more as we go. I think the real foundational basic idea in any drug war college curriculum would be this one. 
this goal, this holy grail goal of the drug-free society, which is talked about completely shamelessly by policymakers all over the world. I just was in South Africa a couple of days ago, and when President Zuma of South Africa ever talks about his drug policy, he never fails to say that it is to achieve a drug-free country. So the idea is that you can make a whole country as well as communities within it drug-free if you have the right policies to get to the complete eradication of anything that's involved with drug production, including people's livelihoods if they happen to grow coca leaf or poppy or uh, cannabis. The um, interdiction of drugs, obviously, before they get to market, once they are in market, the breaking up of those markets. Prevention of new drug use. Oh, that's a big, heavy topic. And for the drug use that is already out there, getting people to be abstinent. That is the idea. That is the vision. There is your drug-free society. And if we were at the Drug War College, I think we'd hear a lot about it. Part of what we'd hear about is uh, pulling out all means, including, again, use of military-type techniques to get rid of these drug-related crops, such as coca leaf in the Andes, which is what you see here. Um, that, that would be very important. It has the wonderful benefit that I think we would also hear about in the Drug War College, that the multinational companies that make the toxic herbicide that the planes are spraying make out very well in this process, as do the military contractors. Uh, when I worked for the UN, you get memos every day because every day is the world day of something in the UN, right? <laughs> uh, or I was in the Francophone countries, we used to say la, la, la journée mondiale de quoi que ce soit, for those of you who speak French. So um, it was a little discouraging to me to find out that the World Day Against Drugs, which is coming up this very week, June 26th, was celebrated in some countries by mass ex execution of people who were convicted of drug crimes. Um, but that's okay. In the, in the drug war college, we would learn that you need, to, you need to pull out all the stops. It's sometimes not pretty. And certainly the corollary, basic idea number two, is that, in fact, applying military measures to base the, the, the goal that's embodied in basic idea number one is really where you want to go if you need to. That can be really effective. Probably the most militarized drug war in the world right now, again, thanks to U.S. support, is in Mexico. Uh, in 2006, then-President Calderon decided that to get at the uh, cartels that were clearly dominating Mexico in the, in the drug war, he would bring the military to the fight. Since then, there have been, depending on whose count you believe, but I think there's pretty good consensus that there have been something on the order of 80,000 deaths on the streets of Mexico because of violence related to this drug war in one way or another. Well, that's okay. It's part of the basic tenets. Okay. Thirdly, all drugs are very, very dangerous, and they're all very addictive. That's where their danger comes from. All of them are damaging to people, physically and psychologically, and if you are um, weak enough to actually take drugs, you will really destroy your own ability to be part of any treatment or any solutions that anyone might propose to you or to understand your own situation. You'd be really messed up. So that's, that's a, very, a very key idea in, uh, in the drug war. Now, if we are at the Drug War College, we will certainly hear a lot from a guy called Harry Anslinger, who would be like the gospel of Harry, is what we would be reading from often. And he was, for 32 years, 32 years, no less, from 1930 to 1962, the head of the narcotics operation of the United States. And uh, this is an example of the kinds of things that he said regularly to the U.S. Congress talking about cannabis, talking about marijuana, as it's called in the US, you see that it makes, oh my god, white women want to seek sexual relations with Negroes. <laughs> it, it causes more insanity, criminality, and death and violence than any other substance on earth, really. This is the gospel according to Harry. And then is it any wonder, and the US then produced films like the film Reefer Madness, which talked about how cannabis was destroying our young people. And then is it any wonder that in 1961, when the first UN drug convention was drawn up, the single convention on narcotic drugs, 
that cannabis was classified as uh, being in the most harmful category, having no medicinal or therapeutic value of any kind. Harry had something to say about that, I think. Now, I grew up, and I'm of more or less the generation of President Obama. So President Obama and I and many other people grew up seeing uh, messages like this in school and also on TV. This is your brain. It's hard to see there. That's a picture of an egg. And this is your fried brain on drugs. Uh, so again, it doesn't matter what drug we're talking about. They're all dangerous. They're all addictive. They're all going to mess you up. Um, scare messages, very common in our, in our classrooms. Uh, that, that was more or less the pedagogical technique here. And I think we learned how to do that in the drug war college. Fourthly, we have to understand that drug addiction is, from, uh, is a character flaw, really. It's a moral weakness. And if you can get to people, especially get to them early, and make them realize that they are morally flawed and they need to dig deep, they need to dig deep, and uh, find the, that strength, find that character that they're missing, they're missing, and then that's how you can get them to be abstinent from drugs. This is the premise of prevention programs and treatment programs, not just in my country, but in many countries in the world. It's, it's uh, well, well, we'll get to that later. So, um, so the mantra, of course, is just say no, dig deep, just say no, and that's another thing that uh, I grew up hearing a lot of. Now, as somebody trained in public health, I, I'm very concerned that this, of course, doesn't correspond to anything that we understand about the science of addiction, but we'll get to that later. But what it has left us with is treatment programs, and I want to say treatment programs, <laughs> uh, that are really meant to be showing people the error of their ways, showing them tough love, rather than showing them what we know to be state-of-the-art care. And the, the, the horror of these things comes up when there are crises, because treatment programs tend to be very hidden and unregulated. In many countries, governments really don't do much in the way of drug treatment. It's all done by faith-based organizations or private sector providers who, know, who make good money telling people that they can cure, telling parents they can cure their children. But when things happen like this, this was in, uh, some years ago in a, a, a drug rehabilitation center in Moscow, there was a fire. And most of the staff escaped with no problem, but most of the patients didn't because they were chained to their beds. Uh, and, and that's when we get the attention of people to the quality of, of care. Uh, these are from our friend Jimmy Darabji from India. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but basically part of the treatment is that we're going to cut off half of people's hair so they will be marked as addicts. Everyone will know that they are addicts and they will be humiliated. I don't know if you can see up there it says changed when chained. This is a program where people are chained, but uh, for every day they are clean, another word I want to put in quotation marks, um, they get another link added to their chain so they can move around more freely. Um, in, some, in some parts of the world, drug treatment looks like this. Now, if this looks to you like a, a labor camp, that's really what it is. In many parts of East Asia, um, people who are convicted of drug offenses, who may not, and I emphasize that most of them probably do not need any kind of treatment, are often uh, sentenced as an alternative to incarceration, that's what, what it's called actually, to a center like this where they get to make trinkets that have an economic importance to their countries, which makes it even harder to reform this kind of idea of drug treatment. Again, happening in all kinds of parts of the world. It, 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 it just, it strikes me that, okay, this is a problem of drug addiction that doesn't affect by any means all of the people who take drugs, and even UNODC says it's probably only 10 or so percent of people who ever take drugs who need treatment, but we're still talking about a problem that millions of people have. Can we think of any other kind of health problem on that scale we were, where we would think of actions like this as constituting legitimate care? Uh, but we would learn about all of this in, in the drug war college because it makes people really dig deep and find their character. Another thing, uh, again, from a public health perspective that we're left with, and I don't know if they would show us this in the drug war college or not, but 
we're left with a terrible problem of um, inaccessibility of medicines that are needed for legitimate uses, medicines that are considered by the UN Drug Conventions to be dangerous and addictive, but that are very useful, such as morphine, very useful for people who have chronic pain or for people who are dying of chronic diseases and need to be made comfortable. We have a t horrible, horrible crisis in that regard. Um, in low and middle in income countries, we find about half of the cancer patients and about 95% of the HIV, but we find almost none of the morphine use. We find almost all of morphine for managing pain is used in a few rich countries in the world. Even though this is not a cost issue, this is an issue about fearing addiction. It's an issue about poor training of health professionals. It's an issue that is a terrible collateral damage of this war on drugs. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Another basic idea is that drug policy and drug law it's, is really very useful as a policy tool because you can scare the hell out of people with it. You can tell them that their, their kids are going to be messed up, they're going to die, they're going to, that, you know. So you can use drug policy for all kinds of things that may not have all that much to do with drugs. And um, people will, historians are beginning to note more and more in the US that this, this phrase, war on drugs, that is always accredited to Richard Nixon, um, came, Richard Nixon announced a war on drugs after the most sweeping civil rights legislation in the country was passed, in the country's history, was passed in the 1960s. That meant that African Americans, for the first time, had very well uh, encoded rights that they hadn't had before, and there are many historians who would say that the war on drugs was really part of the policy armamentarium to keep them in their place. Um, but it's, it's, it wasn't that, it wasn't just in the 1960s, I found this, we found this in, the, in an old article in the New York Times, again, um, associating drug use with a population even if there's no evidence that that, that, that population's use is different from the, from the national population. That, that becomes then a very useful, useful, useful tool. It really helps to get the public worked up about things. Uh, the, the, the instance of this that I remember, and I think you'll be meeting Carl Hart later in the week, he's an expert on the whole hype of hyping of the crack epidemic in the 1980s in the US. So we were told that there were crack mothers and they were giving birth to a generation of crack babies and this was going to overwhelm our social care systems and our, our welfare systems such as it is and so on. There was never such an epidemic. There wasn't, um, at least not anything on the scale that we might have learned of in the drug war problem. Um, and indeed, if we look at the figures, these come from um, some work that was done at Harvard University. If we look at, this is a depiction of incarceration rates for young men, men under the age of 30, both in the general population of young men and those who, where it says less than HS, that they didn't finish secondary school. And this is the Caucasian population in the US. There are two dates here, 1980 to 2004. This is a time of sort of peak drug war activity. But if we add the figures for African American men, we see that this was not an evenly applied policy of incarceration. We see that people like Michelle um, Williams are, are uh, justified in calling this a race war as much as it's a drug war. And this too is something of a corollary to all of these ideas that um, harsh criminal penalties for even for the most minor and nonviolent crimes will be of deterrent effect, uh, both for the person in question who's charged and for others will, who will see that person used as an example. Even though I do not think there is any empirical evidence to back up this idea, there it is. Um, again, I don't know how easy this is to see. We're looking at minimum drug penalties here in a number of Latin American countries at a time between 1950 and 2000 when the US and, and now, more or less, this was done by one of our grantees, Pro Derecho, uh, at a time when the US was pushing these countries for greater penalties, even for minor drug offenses. This is a scary picture to me. And if we look at trafficking, okay, trafficking is of a different order, and we're not talking about minor offenses anymore. But if, if you look at this line uh, of uh, 100, 
basically all of, the, all of the bars that go near or above that line are countries where the average penalty for trafficking is about the same as the average or more than the average penalty for murder. So we're talking about uh, a, a wildly repressive use of criminal law, which is a social tool that we should be worried how we use because we might need it for something important. And again, taking the case of the US uh, as against Western Europe, here we have the incarceration rates per population of a number of Western European countries that have more or less found ways to deal with minor drug offenses other than through incarceration. And at the same time, again, at the height of the drug war, we have the, the rate in the US. Now, we don't know the exact percentage of that very massive incarceration that is linked to minor drug offenses, but we know that it's a lot. And we know that it's more in some states than others. Now, in addition to this, what I think is inappropriate and excessive application of criminal law to minor offenses, we have all kinds of other ways that people can get caught up in the criminal justice net. In the US and many other parts of the world, again, in parts of Africa where I just was and, and parts of Asia, we have paraphernalia laws that, um, that, that would make possessing a sterile syringe a crime or possession laws that would make the trace element in a, of drug in a used syringe a crime. From a public health perspective, of course, you can't think of a more self-defeating policy, can you? It's, it's encouraging people to get HIV, basically. Um, there are many places in the world where health workers are required or they perceive that they are required to register anyone who they think is a drug user with the police. This is a really terrific way of getting the health sector to be part of our drug war. And overall, I think there are many, many countries in the world, including many jurisdictions in my own country, where the police are, the ju are judged on their performance, on their day-to-day -day performance, by the number of arrests that they make. Well, who do you think is going to be the, the people that they target to jack up those arrest figures? Is it going to be the biggest drug kingpin? I don't think so. But we would also learn about that in the Drug War College. Well, the Drug War College had to change its curriculum after September 2001 because now there's a new thing to talk about, very important in our curriculum, and it's called narco-terrorism. So we have another new basic idea that terrorist networks are often funded by, by drug trafficking, and if you've got in front of you a situation of narco trafficking, well, boy, you just better get your war in gear because that's the biggest danger of all. And uh, to tell you the truth, again, um, we've been working very hard to open some more reasoned debates on drug policy in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And it really scares me that the hype on narco-terrorism is very, very strong in Africa right now, thanks largely to the US and the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, even though we do not have very good evidence that drugs are really part of the, the, the terrorist networks that do, in fact, of course, exist. And one of the things that's noted by UNODC frequently is that whereas previously most of the coca and cocaine from the Andean region going to Europe passed through the Caribbean, thanks partly to heavy militarization of some of those Caribbean interdiction uh, um, activities by the US and the countries involved, we now see a fair bit of cocaine traveling to Europe via Africa, via West Africa and Southern Africa, but probably more West Africa in the, in the case of cocaine. That is something to be concerned about, and we're concerned about it too. Um, <laughs> Nigeria, which is the country here that's noted as where methamphetamine laboratories have been seized, is, a, is the largest country in population in sub-Saharan Africa. It has 160 million people. This diagram makes it look like it's one big methamphetamine laboratory. I think there have been, I think there have been three seizures or three discoveries and shutdowns of methamphetamine labs in this country of 160 million people. Nonetheless, um, there is concern being, being raised. Uh, the picture comes from UNODC again. And uh, when the US thinks about how it should be of assistance to this new front in the drug war in Africa, it trots out in front of the Congress, not people from the health, the Department of Health, it trots out people from the Pentagon. 
from the Department of Defense who emphasized the narco terror threat. Um, in addition, the Drug Enforcement Authority, the DEA, uh, thanks to the penal code, is able to intervene outside the US if there is this link to terrorism, uh, however well documented it may be. And there are really good scholars who have actually been on the ground studying this link. Uh, of course, the, the, the thing that's happened in West Africa is Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Maghreb is part of this story. You just say Al-Qaeda in the US and even in the middle of a horrible fiscal crisis, the money is going to fly out of the Congress. Even though we know that Al-Qaeda in the in Islamic Maghreb is mostly funded by kidnappings and other such things, and there's lots of other kinds of trafficking and illicit activities around these things, no question, and drugs is probably part of it. But it's not the part that makes it justifiable to bring in the military hardware. Uh, all right, well. So I do think that we are in a moment when some of these ideas are being challenged. They're being challenged really on the basis of their own empirical evidence, which really trip up some of these basic ideas seriously. And this is what I think the people running the drug war college hope that you won't see. This is a recent piece that was published in the British Medical Journal. It was put together by the International Center for Science and Drug Policy, a group whose website I, I certainly recommend to you. And what they did was basically take all the seizure data as much as they could find country by country, pulling it together, I think, in a little bit more careful way than UNODC does in the annual World Drug Report, and looked at an indicator of actual supply as seen by people who face this market as consumer, consumers, which is price. If the price is going down, we have to figure that supply is probably going up. And what we find, remarkably enough, is that somehow the more time, the more money, the more military energy is spent on seizures and interdictions, we still have these remarkable declines in prices. And we find this in just about all parts of the world. What does that say about the success of our, of our interdiction efforts? Um, you know, the Colombians were not stupid about what was happening to them in the heart of these, these aerial spraying and eradication policies. Um, and what was happening to them was, among other things, and this was documented over time, a high rate of miscarriages, a high rate of uh, certain kinds of cancers, and enormous displacement. Enormous displacement of people who could no longer grow their food crops because their food crops were planted on the, sometimes the same fields as their coca leaf. And so they were losing their livelihood in a sort of double whammy kind of way. Now, all those things were done by aerial eradication, aerial spraying, but what wasn't done by aerial spraying was actually um, reducing the amount of coca leaf being produced. And here, the US's own figures in the, in the time that included the height of aerial spraying, the US has every, every incentive to show that these, these figures are, show that there was a decline in, in, in coca production. Um, and yet we see that when it declined in Colombia, it grew in Peru. When it declined in Peru, it grew in Colombia. What we call the balloon effect. You press it down one place, it pops up in, in the other place. So overall, no real significant decline in coca cultivation for all of this expense and all of this misery. And UNODC's figures pretty much show a similar pattern. Again, a real concern because now as uh, Africa seems to be taking pages from the US supported war on drugs in Latin America, uh, we see cannabis destruction programs, the famous operation Burn the Weed in Nigeria was one, that's where these pictures come from. And, in, and cannabis, even more than coca leaf, is very likely to be interplanted with food crops. And so we're, we're talking about destroying people's food crops, destroying also their livelihood because cannabis is their cash crop without necessarily having an alternative to offer. And, um, well, okay. Certainly something that no one would want anyone to hear about in the drug war college is that there are some countries that are trying to do this in a different way. And I hope we'll have time to talk more about this or you can look it up. Bolivia has a program that it calls, uh, that, that goes by the name Cato. Cato is actually a, a measurement of, of land area. Um, Bolivia has, is in the unusual and possibly non-replicable position of having elected as president a former coca farmer. His name is Evo Morales, 
and he's a very charismatic fellow who comes to the UN uh, Commission on Narcotic Drugs often with his coca tea and his coca soap and his <laughs> coca shampoo, and he says, coca has a traditional value in our society. We recognize that cocaine is a problem, and here are our interdiction and supply reduction and demand reduction efforts, and they are impressive. But we think that there should be some legitimate cultivation of coca for what we consider to be legal uses. They don't hurt anybody, they don't make people crazy, they don't make people addicted. Um, and so he started, uh, his initiative is to have help the coca farmers who were previously met by these forced eradication programs to organize themselves, organize their illicit production, and in return the government would help them develop not just their coca for illicit uses, but also also other kinds of livelihood activities. And this has been enormously successful, but of course it relies on the government being encouraging of unions, strong unions, cooperatives of farmers, which is not something we're going to see in every place. And the government is beginning, this is just, this just started in, uh, in 2007 or so, uh, 2006, seven. Um, the government is beginning to pull together the data from it, and it looks like it has enormously good impact, and it's, it's something where people are participating, they have a voice in how things are organized, this seems to be working, and the market for illicit coca is protected under law now by the government. Um, yeah. Anyway, there are international principles. They've been watered down thanks to the UNODC somewhat, uh, but um, there are principles that, that have been agreed on by all countries through the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Um, and one of the principles is that you don't start ripping out people's crops if that's their livelihood unless you first have something that you've discussed with them as an alternative livelihood and you put it in place. That's a little bit the flaw in a lot of these activities. It seems very, very basic. Um, there, were, there, were, there were things in the original draft from the first consultation on these principles that had to do with taking account of traditional legal uses that all got pulled out. But the, the, the sequencing point is still there and these guidelines are important and need to be respected. Again, coming back to our, our egg-like egg brains and our fried brains after we take drugs. I mean, the problem that we have in the US is that clearly people don't believe these programs anymore and they begin to send them up a little bit. And I mean, we have, we have the real issue for things like amphetamine, especially for things like cannabis, that young people see their friends taking them and their brains aren't fried. Their brain isn't, isn't gone after one hit of cocaine or whatever it might be, and not, and not cannabis either. So. <coughs> We are really in the position in the United States of having wasted billions and billions of dollars, especially on classroom programs. There's a program called DARE that, um, that have now been evaluated and show no results in, in reduction of, 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 of even the age uh, or in increasing the age of first experimentation, which is one of their goals, in reduction of new drug use by any measure. Um, and, and what happens? Because these programs don't, don't say, well, you know, if you do take drugs, here's what you should do to protect yourself from HIV or from hepatitis. They don't say that. What you find is that a lot of the kids who've come through these years and years of abstinence-based drug use are much more susceptible to being hurt by HIV and other harms of drug use because they're not armed with that information. Uh, this is something that the Drug War College would really not want anyone to see. The Lancet, um, which is a prestigious health journal published in the UK, uh, lined up a bunch of experts on addiction, people of very good credentials, and asked them to rank the harms of various addictive substances. And what you see here is, amazingly enough, that, well, heroin and cocaine, of course, at the top of the list, that's not amazing. But alcohol soon follow. And cannabis down here, and cot. You know what cot is? Cot is a plant-based drug raised on the Arabian Peninsula and on the, in the Horn of Africa. It's a mild stimulant. It's something that recently the UK and the Netherlands have both criminalized, have just made illegal, so that as we speak, there are illegal networks, criminal organized crime networks that are, that are supplying the cot market, which is largely a diaspora community from Somalia and Ethiopia and such places in the UK and the Netherlands 
who now will have to deal with criminals to get their cut, something that's usually compared by addiction experts to caffeine, which should be on this list, by the way, but it's not. <laughs> All right. Um, one of George Soros's ideas has been that since it's very hard for sitting politicians often to talk about uh, drugs or to talk about less repressive drug policies because they will be accused of being soft on crime or soft on drugs, let's get former presidents to do that. And what you see here is uh, part of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, a group that has been extraordinarily effective in many parts of the world in opening up debates on drugs. Uh, the picture here is of, uh, from left to right, Richard Branson, who is not a former head of state, but somebody who reaches audiences of another kind. And I love when he opens his mouth and says, you know, if I have a business that's failing, I shut it down. Why are we continuing with this failing war? It's a pretty good line. And next to him, Ruth Dreyfus, the former president of Switzerland. Next to her, uh, president Car former president Cardoso of Brazil. Who, has been a, who is the chair of this commission, has been a wonderful spokesperson for less repressive policies, and next to him, former President Gaviria of Colombia. Um, now, Kofi Annan was also part of the Global Commission, and when he joined the Global Commission, George Soros asked him, and President Cardoso also asked him, to do something about the situation in Africa. And so Kofi Annan, I think using you know, a lot of his personal reputation and clout, pulled together a, uh, a group of former heads of state in West Africa, his region, um, as well as some former minister level people and some representatives of civil society. The West African <coughs> Commission on Drugs, which you can Google and find, uh, recently released, released their report last week. I was in Dakar for the release. Kofi Annan was there, it was really helpful for Kofi Annan to be there because the commission called for decriminalization of use itself, of consumption as an offense, and of minor possession. Uh, this, was, this is a very, very hard discussion and the press was all wild about decriminalization and what that meant, lots of confusion between decriminalization and legalization, which I know you will never confuse. Um, but a really good discussion, and of course, having Kofi Annan there, having present, former President Obasanjo, who is still a pretty strong guy, um, from Nigeria at, at the chair, in the chairmanship of this commission, made it, made it a, a very interesting discussion. The, the commission said that criminal law should not be applied where there is no demonstrable criminal intent. That's a, that's a tenet of criminal law. Societies believe that criminal law should be reserved for the most repugnant offenses where there is clearly criminal intent. Where is the criminal intent in lighting up a joint? I don't know. Um, <laughs> there shouldn't be any criminal law where there's no evidence of, of of deterrence. We have no evidence of deterrence of any kind by all the harsh application of criminal law to minor offenses. That is to say, we have no scholarship of any kind that I have been able to see that people, when they think about, oh, am I going to take this drug, what's in the law? Let's see, let me consult the penal code and see how long I would go to prison if I'm caught. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and the commission, I think, especially strongly for, and especially importantly for this region, said that drug laws now are being disproportionately applied to the poor. The big fish swim away, as President Obasanjo said, and the small fry get caught. Um, so, and we see this kind of conversation happening in places where I didn't think it would. In Morocco, which is the world's most important producer of hashish, which is the cannabis resin as opposed to the cannabis leaf. Uh, there is a large conversation happening in the parliament on whether there can be legal uses for, as they say, industrial and medical purposes of the cannabis plant. And the farmers are organized. They're getting more and more organized because they know this is their livelihood. They're tired of dealing with organized criminal networks and they think that they have a product that could find illicit market. I was honored to be one of two people from outside of Africa who was invited to be part of the writing committee of the new five-year policy of the African Union, which is sort of the UN, the multilateral body for the African countries. And having previously had policies that were all about policing, we managed, and it was a big struggle, we managed to get the ministers and then the heads of state eventually to approve a policy that talks about finding ways to deal with consumption outside of the criminal justice system as a public health issue. 
calls for respect of human rights of people who use drugs in ways that previous policies didn't. This is good to have it on paper. It's very, very difficult to find support in countries. That's why I think the West Africa Commission was so important, and now we have some interest in doing similar things in other parts of Africa. So, will the drug policy reformers win? I don't know, but I think that some pages are being turned. In the process of this business of making a licit market for coca leaf in Bolivia, Bolivia, which had ratified the UN drug conventions under a military government before the coca farmer was elected president, decided that it needed to think again about that ratification. It withdrew from the UN Drug Convention, which is a treaty. Any of you who know about human rights treaties and trade treaties and so on will know that there's always that possibility. And then it, it, it signaled its desire to re-accede to the treaty with a reservation about traditional uses of coca leaf. This was taken very, very ill by the UN system. It was not well seen by the US. And the treaty, the UN Drug Conventions in question say that if 63 countries, was that the number? Uh, if 63 countries had ratifying states had decided that they, they didn't approve of this measure on Bolivia's part, they could have blocked it and Bolivia would essentially been left out from the treaties and be a pariah and the US would decertify it and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that only 15 countries lined up to say that they didn't approve of this measure. The US was one, Sweden was one, Japan was one, the, the big prohibitionist countries, Russia, and um, and a number of Middle Eastern countries as well. So, um, so we, we have now this precedent, this precedent that showed graphically that there is probably more flexibility within these treaties if governments take the policy seriously and bring out their international law experts and do it right than we might have thought before. We have much more research on the wastefulness of the drug war, on the costs of the drug war in human lives, as well as in money. Um, we were part of uh, supporting a, some work by the London School of Economics that I also encourage you to look at on the website of their in-house think tank, which is called Ideas. Five Nobel Prize winning economists endorsed a report that I was also proud to be part of uh, putting together uh, that showed essentially in economic terms that this war on drugs is completely wrong-headed. Um, we have in Sub-Saharan Africa big challenge most repressive laws in the world, along with parts of Asia. Um, we have the country of Tanzania that has had a very well-documented and visible uh, heroin injection problem for a very long time, especially along the Indian Ocean coast. And with the US support doing something good for once, they now have some really excellent health services, a methadone program for these young people who inject heroin that's really transforming a lot of lives. And so much so that the police who themselves had seen their own sons and daughters and nephews die of heroin overdose and otherwise struggle with heroin addiction. The police now in some of the affected communities are seeing it as their job to get people into the treatment center rather than to keep arresting them over and over again. I didn't think I would ever see anything like that in a place like Tanzania and it's very important. It's a little bit under the radar screen but it's really an important precedent and I think something like that will be happening in other parts of Africa too. Um, with two years, two long years of advocacy, um, a number of our organizations were able to wrest out of the UN a statement against the abuses in these what are essentially forced labor camps, drug, alleged drug rehabilitation centers in some parts of the world, and that's been helpful. It's been really helpful for advocacy in country. And at the last session of the UN, Commission on Narcotic Drugs, UNODC, the Office on Drugs and Crime, which is the Secretariat of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, actually made statements saying that, no, you don't need under the terms of the UN Drug Conventions to criminalize use itself. They're less happy to comment on minor possession, but use itself, they said, <coughs> countries really should start thinking about that as a public health issue. Amazing. However, the fine print, of course, in anything that UNODC puts out, is that they are seeing as the alternative here, possibly not just treatment in the community run by the public health system, but they're very hot on this idea of drug courts, drug treatment courts, which are very now very prevalent in the US. The US is actually supporting those as part of foreign assistance in many parts of the world, notably in Latin America. And 
it's okay. Drug courts are meant to be sort of court court supervised treatment as an alternative to incarceration, which sounds really good on paper, but the devil is a little bit in the details. So that in the US model, um, health people are often not part of these decisions about how treatment should go. And that makes me very uncomfortable because this is a health problem that's a complex health problem that we're talking about. The other thing about the US model is that in most jurisdictions, you have to actually plead guilty to whatever the charge is in front of you to be able to participate in this court mandated treatment. If you fail your treatment, now the WHO calls addiction a chronic relapsing condition. That means that relapse is a normal part of it. If you fail and you relapse in the, in the drug court model in the US in most places, you get thrown back into the adversarial court with your guilty plea on the record. You're probably gonna wind up in worse shape than if you had ever participated in, in the program and if you had been able to argue your case in a regular court in the first place. So lots of things to watch out for there. Really, I think still the, 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 the living, breathing models, the hope that we have for countering drug war ideas is in the Western European experience. Much as these experiences are constantly challenged politically, and especially if in, at, this, at this moment in history in Europe, if you can make the case, if you're a politician, that it's mostly immigrants who are doing drugs or selling drugs, you're gonna have a political hot potato on your hands. In the Netherlands, which, uh, and, and most of the, of the, of the rel relatively liberalized policies, especially on cannabis in Western Europe, come from a time when people were worried about HIV. In Nether the Netherlands, however, this policy of the famous coffee shops, which I know I don't have to explain to you, um, came from before HIV was even on the agenda. This is a policy from the late 1960s and 70s. And it is a policy that really exists for one reason, and it's a brilliant reason that you will never hear at the Drug War College, which is that if you can make a, a welcoming and a, an illicit and, and legal market for people who are buying controlled amounts of cannabis, you will keep them from having to get their cannabis from a heroin dealer or a cocaine dealer. That was a measure to keep young people from having to deal with hard drug dealers. It was brilliant. It works. It's, it's really uh, part of what inspired the country of Uruguay to pass its own law, making cannabis legal for all purposes. It was a harm reduction measure. They wanted to get, separate the cannabis market from the hard drug market. Um, and yet this is always politically controversial, especially in the border towns of the Netherlands, as you know. Portugal was a country that was faced with an absolutely explosive HIV epidemic linked to drug use and decided that the way to deal with it was not to crack down on people, but rather to essentially decriminalize all consumption offenses and get people into the health system in that way. Another brilliant success, people are encouraged but not obliged to come and talk to what committees that have the unfortunate name of a committee of dissuasion, but still, um, and they, uh, they're basically asked if there's something behind their, their drug use that they need help with. And they can get help on housing, on employment, training, on lots of things. And in fact, the, the numbers on HIV are stunning. There's really pretty much these days not much HIV transmission at all among the people who use inject drugs in Portugal. And here's something that I truly never thought I would see in a million years. This is US public opinion on the question of legalization of cannabis. Now, you saw, you have a history here where the gap is very wide against the idea of legalization of cannabis. How did this come together so quickly around 2008, 2009? I think, I'm sure all of you are aware that in 2012, the states of Washington and Colorado went to the polls and they voted to legalize all uses of cannabis, all production, all sale. It's now regulated like alcohol is regulated in those states. What happened here? I think the answer is a lot of things and maybe you have some ideas. Uh, it doesn't seem to me an accident that this happens at a time of fiscal crisis, of deep fiscal crisis for the US, the states can only tax people in so many ways and they have services to put out. They, they are in charge of putting out education services and a lot of other services. Um, it does seem to me that we have people who are just sick of uh, all of the incarceration and the arrests for cannabis offenses. It doesn't seem right to them. But I think actually, uh, 
the argument that probably held sway, at least in parts of Washington State, we have some evidence of this, was that people were convinced that, yeah, there might be leaks and there might be problems in a legalized market, but it was still better than having their kids have to go to a heroin dealer to get cannabis or have, having to go to an illegal market in it of any kind to get cannabis. Um, that there might be some chance of actually keeping cannabis more out of the hands of juveniles in a regulated market. And I think that that argument was well put out by people who understood these things. We don't know. These are the first experiences on earth of a truly legal cannabis market. We're going to have to look carefully. And I can tell you that the people who graduated from the drug war college are very active trying to mobilize their data. They are already saying there are more traffic accidents related to cannabis, though I don't think we have good evidence of that. They're already saying that there are kids spending the nights in hospital by ingesting brownies and so on and so forth. We're going to hear it all. We're going to hear it all. Um, mobilization of civil society in general across the world is very intense right now, partly because we have a UN General Assembly special session on guess What a terrible, terrible acronym. Um, coming up in 2016. The last such one of these was held in 1998, and it was held under the motto, a drug-free world, we can do it. Well, we don't know if there's going to be that song sung again, but I hope that there will be enough voices saying, a drug-free world, we can't do it. And we think that um, this has to be a different debate. It has to be a different debate even just with these uh, changes that have happened in cannabis policy around the world. I don't know if you can spot a familiar face in this photo. The President of the United States looks quite a lot like he did in, at the time of his secondary school graduation, which is when this photo was taken. There he is. Uh, this photograph of the president, of uh, the, the future president, with his, uh, I don't know if you can see what the cake says there, it says, class of 1970, whatever it is, Chum Gang. Chum is the local in Hawaii where this was taken, and where the dress code for graduation is apparently very casual. <laughs> um, in Hawaii, they call cannabis Chum, and the president was part of this club. And uh, one of his good friends here charmingly dug up this photo in the middle of the presidential election. <laughs> but Barack Obama had pretty much dealt very openly up to that point with his whole drug pa past, and it didn't really come back to hit him, as it would have Bill Clinton, who in the campaign trail famously said that he used marijuana, but he didn't inhale. <laughs> Barack Obama very quickly used that and said, of course I inhaled, that's the whole idea. <laughs> so the question is how this generation of leaders, somebody who I think learned quickly that there is a peace movement to be had in this war on drugs, in 2016, probably in the summer when this UN meeting will happen, at a time when the US presidential campaign will be hot and heavy and it will involve everyone in the world except Barack Obama, Maybe without the, the spotlight on him, will he send a US delegation to this meeting to say something other than we need more policing or we need harsher drugs? We will see. This is now the president who allowed the, Was the Washington and Colorado experiences to go forward, who's likely to be challenged again with more states in this year's election. In any case, will the reformers win? I think the answer to that might be in the hands of people like you. So I encourage you to learn this war, where the war is raging, why, who are the players, and where the truth is. And I encourage you, too, to learn the peace movement that in accompanies this war more and more intensively, tries to highlight the injustices that are part of this war, and especially to define what justice should look like for the people who find themselves involved with drugs in one way or another. I thank you again for this opportunity, and I really wish you a great time here in Budapest dealing with this very complex issue. Thank you.